Genesis 2 still this morning, so I invite you to grab your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis 2. We're going to be looking at verses 16 and 17 together. If you're using the blue ESV Bible and the seatbacks in front of you, you can find our text on page 2. Genesis 2, 16 and 17, the title of our sermon is Life and Death. A question that we have pondered already several times in this series, what is man? It's a question that we're asking early on. What is man? What is his relationship with God? The end of Genesis 1 tells us that man was made in God's image, and he was given the royal task of being fruitful, multiplying, filling the earth, and subduing it. Humanity was then invited, at least by way of implication, in the beginning of Genesis 2, in the first three verses, to enter into God's rest that he had won for himself in ordering the universe for productive and fruitful ends. And then Genesis 2, beginning in verse 4, um, all the way through verse 25, we're brought back to the sixth day of creation, and we're given a closer look at this making and forming and commissioning of the man. We see his creation in verses 4 through 7, his commission in 8 through 17, and his complement in, or 8 through 17, and his complement in verses 18 through 25. And last week, we began a consideration of the commission of the man. We noted that God had formed the man and then placed him inside the garden sanctuary of Eden in order that he might serve God as a priest and guard the holy space wherein God would dwell with him. We saw also prior to that in 2.7 that God in raising Adam from the dust of the earth by the breath of life, he was teaching us to anticipate Adam's royal identity as one who would exercise dominion over the ground from which he was taken. And so Adam is charged in uh, this day with protecting the sanctity of the holy place and with expanding its borders to every square inch of the planet. Today we see that before the king can engage in his world-subduing act of dominion, he must be tested. Here in verses 16 and 17, God places an explicit prohibition upon the terms of his relationship with Adam, wherein Adam is called upon to demonstrate complete obedience and loyalty to his maker. Let me read these verses here. I'll read 15 through 17 and then outline them and we'll get to work. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Three things that I want you to consider with me this morning. The first is we need to ask what what should we understand generally about this command that is given here in the overall context of God and Adam's relationship with one another? So something of the nature of this command will be considered under this first heading. Second, we need to consider the terms of the command, both in what Adam was commanded and invited to do as well as what he was prohibited from doing. And third, we'll consider the consequences of the command. And so what's the nature of the command, the terms of the command, and the consequences of the command? First, then, consider with me the nature of this command. If you remember, uh, we mentioned, we have mentioned in weeks past that the use of God's covenant name, Yahweh, translated as Lord in, uh, in the Bible, You see it, Lord, in all caps. It's God's covenant name, Yahweh. And that began in chapter 2, verse 4. And it's used here, at least in part, to alert us to look for the establishment of 
a covenant. Covenant is the way in which God relates to His people all throughout Scripture. This is what have been especially clear to the Israelites under the Old Covenant. And so to see God's covenant name beginning in 2.4 and repeated here several times in our passage, we are being told that this is a, a full, big flashing indicator that we're entering a covenantal context. Besides the use of God's covenant name, we're also told back in verse 8 that the Lord God put the man that he had formed in the garden. God created the man outside of the garden and then places him within the garden with kingly and, res- and priestly responsibilities. Now, something I didn't mention last week looking at verse Eight is that that term put in verse 8 often conveys theological and religious action in a covenantal context. Consider Deuteronomy 10, 2. I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you shattered, and you shall put them in the ark. 1 Kings 7.51, Solomon brought in the things dedicated by his father David, the silver and the gold and the utensils, and he put them in the treasuries of the house of the Lord. Now this word, there's a word in verse 15, the Lord took the, took the man and put him in the garden. That is a different Hebrew word, but it is translated as put, the same. Often it's translated as rest. But we read in 1 Kings 8, 9, There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone Moses put there at Horeb, where the Lord God, or where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And so we have this covenantal sanctuary context all in Genesis chapter 2. And we have these two words, both translated as put in verse 8 and verse 15. They're used similarly in other passages in the Old Testament. And so again, further, we are are being told that we're on high alert for the formation of a covenant here. But before we look at what the text actually says, we should define covenant. What does the word typically mean? How should we understand it? Well, a pretty good and simple definition is, would be this. A covenant is an arrangement between two or more persons wherein each party agrees to fulfill and abide by certain conditions with consequences attending the fulfillment or breaking of those conditions. So you have some arrangement, two or more parties, where each one is fulfilling uh, obligations and conditions, and then there are consequences both good for fulfilling those obligations or uh, consequences that are negative if those obligations are broken. Divine covenants would be particularly different in that they are freely and sovereignly enacted by God alone as He condescends in love and goodness to those with whom He covenants. God initiates and unilaterally sets the conditions and consequences of the covenant. So covenants can be entered into by two people, or more than two people, um, mutually agreeing upon the terms. But in a divine covenant, God initiates and sets the terms of the covenant. So what do we see here in Genesis 2? Well, we've already seen that God has sovereignly initiated this relationship. He created the man. He placed the man in the garden. He spoke to the man. And we see a a condition set forth here in, in our passage in verse 16, 17. He says, You may eat of every tree in the garden, but there is one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, from which you shall not eat. So we see the parties involved, we see a condition set forth, and we also see a curse threatened upon the breaking of this condition. In the day that you do eat of this tree, you shall surely die. But there's implied here a word of promise for blessing if the condition is kept. Right? We might phrase it, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. The promise might be, in the day you do not eat of it, you will surely live. 
They say that if something looks like a duck, walks like a duck, swims and quacks like a duck, then it's a duck. Well, turns out it's the same with covenants. Because the term covenant is not used here in Genesis 2. But we have all the necessary components of a covenant present in the passage. Now we do have other instances, um, at least one, maybe, maybe a couple, where other authors of Scripture seem to view the relationship established here in covenantal terms. In Hosea 6-7, for instance, we read, Like Adam, they transgressed the covenant. There they dealt faithlessly with me. Now, this is a highly disputed text, to be honest. There is certainly a possibility that the reference is to a place called Adam rather than to the man, Adam. Um, Joshua 3.16 seems to mention the place, Adam. So while there is genuine debate about this, and we don't want or need to be overly dogmatic that Hosea 6.7 is settling the debate about whether there is a covenant made between God and Adam in Genesis 2, there's good reason to think that that passage in Hosea may be functioning sort of as a double entendre of sorts, where Hosea sees in Judah's breaking of their covenant, he's recalling both Israel's sin at Adam and Adam's sin in the garden. But however you understand the Hosea passage, we, we see in Genesis 2 itself good enough reason to understand a covenant being made here. So what is the nature of this covenant? What kind of covenant is established here with Adam? The truth is, among Reformed theologians at least, the, the question of whether there is a covenant with Adam is usually not terribly debated. The nature of the covenant is one that's much more uh, of, of greater concern to, to the debate. Well, our confession of faith, 1689, Confession of the London Baptist, says... Um, calls it a covenant of works. Now, I think the term covenant of works can be misunderstood. Um, personally, I, I think names like covenant of life, covenant of creation, everlasting covenant, um, a la Isaiah 24.5, I think those are, are fine names for it and can be very helpful. But I do think that the term covenant of works also helpfully captures the nature of this relationship. There's a book that I've found particularly helpful, uh, Pascal Deneau's book, The Distinctiveness of Baptist Covenant Theology, a, a riveting title to be sure. Um, he writes of this covenant between God and, and man. He says, the, the covenant of works had a simple way of functioning. If Adam had obeyed, he and his posterity after him would have retained life and would have been sealed in justice. But his disobedience marked the entrance of death into the world. The gist then is that God established a covenant with Adam with the expectation of perfect and complete obedience on Adam's part. It was a covenant made between God and sinless man, and this sinless man was charged to remain sinless. Were he to do so, he would have ascended beyond his sinless innocence into a glorified and everlasting perfection that he did not initially possess. It was not a covenant of grace whereby Adam was being gifted something he didn't earn, namely everlasting life, sealed righteousness, and a, uh, a, a glory of wisdom. Now, as our confession states in chapter 7, paragraph 1, that because the distance between man and God is so great, man could never have attained the reward of life but by some voluntary condescension on God's part. Nevertheless, that does not take away from the fact that Adam here had to offer complete and total obedience to God's command for the attainment of what? was promised. Anything less than full and total obedience, and he would forfeit not only the current blessings that he enjoyed, but he would also forfeit the greater blessings that he was seeking to obtain. 
And as we said last week in particular, the context of this covenant indeed is the great and lavish generosity of God. God had formed Adam and given him life. He put him in a good, beautiful, and useful garden and commanded him to make it flourish. But we must not miss in these verses that apart from perfect and utter obedience on Adam's part, death and alienation from God was certain. And so that's sort of a scene-setting point to make, the nature of this command. And we'll see it as we look more at these verses here. The point to take away into our examination of the text is that the command here by God formalizes a covenant of works with Adam. And so let's look more closely at the text, at the command. God tells Adam positively here in verse 16 that he may eat freely of every tree of the garden with one exception. Positively, Eat from every tree in the garden. Negatively, there's one tree from which you may not eat, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so the first thing to note here about this command, as as I alluded to a moment ago, is the generosity of God. He lavishes blessing upon Adam here. We saw last week that God had caused every tree to spring up in the garden that was good for food and beautiful to the eyes. And from those trees, God said plainly to Adam, Eat. Eat from every single one of them. He places but one restriction upon the man in regards to the eating from these trees. We cannot say it enough. God is not, and he was not, a stingy miser. He was not cruelly withholding from Adam. He was over the top with his blessing here. Every tree in this garden is yours But for right now, there's one from which you must abstain. And so we see the generosity of God. But a second thing we need to consider regarding the the terms of this command, we need to consider the command itself, the prohibition, in relation to what we might call God's eternal law. Nehemiah Cox says that when Ecclesiastes 7.29 says that God made man upright. He says this uprightness or rectitude of nature consisted in the perfect harmony of his soul with that law of God which he was made under and subject to. He defines this law as an eternal law, an invariable rule of righteousness by which those things that are agreeable to the holiness and rectitude of the divine nature were required, and whatever is contrary to it was prohibited. This law, says Cox, was written on Adam's heart, and he would have needed no external revelation to perfect his knowledge of it. So would Adam have known that it was wrong, say, to murder someone? Yes. Right? The essence of this law, this eternal law of God, we find summed up in the ten words given to Israel— on Mount Sinai. They are even further summarized by the two great commands, which Jesus repeats in the New Testament, to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. This law, to love God supremely and to love others as ourselves, is a reflection of God's own nature. His immutable, it is immutable and invariable. But Nehemiah Cox goes on in describing this command here in Genesis 2. He says, It pleased the sovereign majesty of heaven to add to the eternal law a positive precept in which he charged man not to eat of the fruit of one tree in the midst of the Garden of Eden. The eating of this fruit was not a thing evil in itself, but was made so by divine prohibition. In short, this this one positive command, not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, stood as a a representative of the entirety of God's law. This one command brought to 
a focal point, one question. Adam, will you trust God, believe his word, and follow his command? Or would you believe some other word? In this one positive command, God gives the man a test of loyalty and obedience. He offered Adam life and glory and blessing upon the condition of full obedience expressed through this one representative point of law. So the question, would Adam accept life, glory, and blessing upon God's terms? Or would he insist upon obtaining those things on his own terms? I think we see this more clearly when we consider the tree itself. This tree from which he was forbidden to eat. He was forbidden from eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's a curious name for a tree, isn't it? Especially curious name for a tree that existed in a world that according to God, all throughout chapter 1 of Genesis, this world was good. It was good. It was indeed very good. The knowledge of good and evil? Well, this phrase, the knowledge of good and evil, elsewhere, elsewhere in Scripture, seems to function as a synonym for wisdom. Greg Beale well describes this tree in his book, We Become What We Worship. He writes, Even the name of the tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, of which Adam was not to eat, was suggestive of Adam's magisterial duty. The discerning between good and evil is a Hebrew expression that refers to kings or authoritative figures being able to make judgments in carrying out justice. One of the clearest places we see this is in King Solomon's prayer for wisdom when he became king over Israel. He prays in 1 Kings 3.9, Give your servant an understanding mind to govern your people that I may discern between good and evil. The Lord responds favorably, granting the request, saying, Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind. And at the conclusion of that episode in chapter 3 of 1 Kings, verse 28, we read, And all Israel heard of the judgment that the king had rendered, the famous splitting of the baby proposal. They heard of that judgment that the king had rendered, and they stood in awe of the king because they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to do justice. So Solomon asked for an understanding mind that he might be able to discern between good and evil. And God says, you got it. Here's a truckload of wisdom. And his wisdom is demonstrated particularly in his royal, kingly rendering of judgment to provide justice for his people. Uh, Beale further summarizes the function of this tree in Genesis. He says this, he says, In this light, the tree in Eden seems to have functioned as a judgment tree, the place where Adam should have gone to discern between good and evil. And thus he should have judged the serpent as evil and pronounced judgment on it as it entered the garden. Now the Solomon narrative doesn't include a tree of judgment. But we do see elsewhere in Scripture that trees did function as places where judgments were to be pronounced. Deborah, one of Israel's judges, for instance, would render judgments under a tree in Judges 4-5. Saul, in 1 Samuel 22, 6-19, renders judgments. He renders a judgment against the priests of Nob for their having helped David, ordering Doag, the Edomite, to strike them down to death. Now, of course, that was a wicked judgment from Saul, but nonetheless, we see trees functioning as places of judgment. The law condemns the one hanged on a tree as cursed. And so, Beale and others have noted from these examples that trees were symbolic of judgment. Judgment usually pronounced by a prophet, even. 
And that's interesting that Beale would note that because while we see the kingly connection between the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right, we see that with Solomon, if there's a prophetic element in this judgment rendering to be drawn out here, then we have yet another aspect of Adam's identity set before us. We've seen that Adam was a king, a priest, and perhaps now even a prophet in the garden, which we see clearly in the Lord Jesus as he fulfills all three of these offices in his messianic ministry in the Gospels. It's prophet, priest, and king. But why does any of this matter? What does it matter what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was, that it represented some attaining of wisdom? Well, we'll see in Genesis 3 that this is the very tree where temptation, in fact, came to choose between good and evil. It's where the tempter came to Adam and Eve. This was the very tree where Adam was to be tested. Would he seek for wisdom according to God's will, or would he seek for it some other way? Adam was created sinless, but he was not yet positively righteous. There was an innocent immaturity from which Adam needed to mature through obedience at the tree of wisdom. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was the testing ground where Adam was meant to attain the full stature of maturity and manhood and become a wise king to extend God's temple palace to the ends of the earth. And is this not the very thing that we will see the serpent offer to the woman in Genesis 3? He tells her, no, 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 no. You will not surely die. You will become like God in knowing good and evil. You will become like God in being wise. And what is it that she notices about the tree? It was desired to make one wise. And so Adam should have, so what should Adam have done? This is the command, don't eat from the tree. Well, when he's standing at the tree with his wife, and a serpent comes out of the tree offering to her wisdom in a direct violation of God's will, Adam should have dragged the serpent out of the tree, cut off its head, and thrown it out of the garden. I'll quote Beale once more. He says, Adam should have discerned that the serpent was evil and judged him in the name of God at the place of the judgment tree. Spoiler alert. That's not what happens. Adam doesn't judge the serpent. He, in fact, himself is judged at the tree. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here. We're not in Genesis 3 yet. But those are the terms of the covenant. Eat freely from every tree in this place, but there is one tree from which you must not eat now. There is a test coming. So be warned and prepared, Adam. What about the consequences of the covenant, of this command? You see this at the end of verse 17. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And as I said earlier, there's an implied statement of a positive consequence. In the day that you don't eat of it, you will surely live. God is telling Adam to be prepared. Adam, stand guard. Remember, Adam is a priest. Stand guard. Serve God in this temple as a priest to the Most High God. There's one tree from which you may not eat. The day that you do eat of it, attempting to obtain the wisdom and glory that I'm offering to you through obedience, that day you will forfeit not only those blessings, but even the blessings you enjoy now. Thorns and thistles will mark your existence in the day that you eat of it until you eventually return to the dust from which you were taken. You will lose your very life, he says. In dying, you will die. But he also understood 
Should you withstand this test? Should you keep to my word, Adam? Should you guard the sanctuary well when the tempter comes? You will be confirmed as my righteous servant. Everlasting life will be perpetually established for you and for those whom you represent. You will progress from unwise, though not foolish, but from unwise to wise, from sinless to positively righteous, from simple to mature. I mentioned Pascal Dino earlier, his book, The Distinctiveness of Baptist Covenant Theology. He remarks that as um, our Baptist, uh, particular Baptist forefathers, uh, as well as their, their, their uh, Presbyterian brothers, they understood that this covenant establishes the principle of do this and live. We find this repeated in Exod- uh, Leviticus 18.5. We see Paul affirming this principle in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Right? Fail to keep God's command here in Genesis 2, and death comes. Keep it, and there's life. Now, we need to be clear about something here. Adam was not working for God's love in the garden. He already had God's love as a son, as an image bearer. But he was working for a reward. The covenant doesn't run upon the lines of do this and I will love you, but do this and you will live. God had made Adam upright, according to Ecclesiastes 7.29, and ordered him to resist any temptation that might come before him in order that he may be sealed in that righteousness forever. But it's not as though God didn't know what Adam would do. Not as though God hadn't ordained the whole thing. It it wasn't a shock to him that Adam failed. But this command and Adam's subsequent failure exposes for us the weakness of the creature. Even Adam, in his state of innocence, apart from complete trust in his Creator, was incapable of preserving himself in faithfulness. And so this covenant of works makes the point loud and clear. Do not rely on yourself. So what do we do? What do we do with all of this? What kinds of lessons can we draw from these few verses here? The first, I'll say it, I've said it again, I've said it already, I'll say it again. God is generous. By His very nature, we see God is full of generosity. He loves to give good things to His creatures. We can't overstate this. God is the most generous and joyful giver of all. This hasn't changed even with the entrance of sin into the world and the death that we've brought upon ourselves. God is still the kind of being who overflows in generosity. And so the question for you, brothers, sisters, do you see God in this way? Do you see God as kind, as benevolent, as generous, as extravagant in His gifts to the world? Or is God kind of stingy in your mind? Kind of miserly? Does God like to withhold good things from you? If you believe this, you're going to find yourself tempted to make constant runarounds in God's providence in your life. You're going to be stricken with discontentment and bitterness and anger and hatred toward God, toward others, toward yourself. If you believe that God is constantly wronging you by denying you what you deserve, you are going to be miserable. The truth is, God is the kind of being that loves to give good gifts to his children. And he's the kind of being that gives actually good gifts. He's perfectly wise in his administration and distribution of gifts. 
You may think something is good, and maybe it's not. You may think something is good right now, but maybe it's not. A good thing at the wrong time becomes a wrong thing. So we need to remember that from the get-go, from the very beginning, Genesis is adamant. God is a generous, overflowing, kind, and benevolent God who loves the world that he made. But a second thing that we see from this passage, God is holy. God made Adam in his own image. He formed him personally from the dust of the ground. He breathed into him the breath of life. Adam was a son of God. He was his prophet, priest, and king in the world. He imbued him with life, and he set him in this world that was good, that was productive, and would become more productive under his care. He offered him glory, and yet that does not change the fact that God is perfectly, completely holy, and he will have no association with sin, with an idolater. God was generous, but the law given to Adam was clear and unbending. In the day you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. The life, blessing, and freedom that Adam enjoyed in the garden would all be stripped from him in an instant. And as we see in chapter 3, those things are taken from him. And so, perhaps the, the, the flip side of what I was asking you a moment ago, do you see God as stingy on the one hand, on the other hand, do you see God's kindness and His generosity either here in Genesis 2 or even this side of the fall? Do you see His grace as an excuse and a license for sin? Maybe you don't view God as greedy, but you view Him as weak. You think it is his job to forgive you, to let your sins slide. We must not trifle with God. God is holy, and we are called to be holy. We asked the question at the beginning of the sermon what is man? Man is a being under authority. He is under the authority of God. He is called to be holy because God who made him is holy. And yet that brings us to a third, a final point of application to make this morning. This covenant with Adam shows us our great need for Christ. Returning to Nehemiah Cox again, he makes the point that we have a more particular and express mention made of the threatened curse than of the promised reward, because even though both, the curse and the reward, would have been of equal clearness to Adam, it is more important for us to be thoroughly humbled under a sense of the present misery of mankind in our lapsed state than to curiously inquire after the particular mode or degree of that blessedness which was once proposed, but can never now be obtained by us in the interest of that covenant which first gave a man a right to it. Right, this is important because at no point was this covenant ever rescinded. We're all born into it. And yet it's broken. It only brings cursing and condemnation for those who live under it. So if you were born, you were born in Adam under a broken covenant. The covenant no longer offers any blessing to you. You see where we're going? How do we get to Christ? Christ was born of woman, born under the law, he came into this world in order that through actual obedience to God's law, he might become the founder and guarantor of a better covenant. 
The only way for us to escape the penalties of the covenant of works, namely death and alienation from God, the only way to escape that is to be represented by another, by another head, the head of a different covenant. This is, this is essentially what Paul discusses in Romans chapter 5. Adam, the head of one covenant, disobeyed and brought condemnation and death upon all those whom he represented, the human race. Christ, the head of another covenant, obeyed and brought justification and life for all those whom he represents, his chosen people. So the question for you, the question for us this morning is this, who is your federal head? Who is it that represents you before God? Is it Adam, the first Adam, or the last Adam? Is it Adam or is it Christ? Have you believed in Jesus? If you haven't, do so. Look to Christ and live. The first Adam offers you nothing but death. That's all he has left to offer as a covenant head. Christ, however, has everything to offer. So look to Christ. Trust in Him. Place yourself in His care through faith. God is reconciling the world to Himself in Christ. And he extends that gracious offer to you now. And so if you don't know Christ, I would urge you, young or old, don't resist any longer. But if you are in Christ, rejoice. The penalty for this broken law has been borne. The judgment that was to take place at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that was rendered at the tree on Calvary. Christ has become to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And so, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Your upright and restored relationship to God is not based on one ounce of your own wisdom, brother, sister. It's not based on one ounce of your own righteousness, your own good working, your own keeping of any law. It is based fully on your covenant head, Christ, who obeyed the law a to Z, for you, who suffered the penalty of a broken law, who conquered death, who's been raised to newness of life and now sits at God's right hand as king of the world. And so what shall we render to the Lord for all his benefits to us? May we, with the psalmist, simply lift the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord, trusting Him to draw near and to save.